Welcome back to Cause Talk Radio by Rashpixel.fm, the podcast that shows do-gooders, nonprofits, and businesses how to build win-win partnerships that raise money and change the world. This podcast is brought to you by the Cause Marketing Forum and Selfish Giving. You can find full show notes and additional resources for today's episode at CauseUpdate.com and SelfishGiving.com. Now on to today's episode. Hey everyone, this is Joe Waters, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Cause Talk Radio. And on the line, of course, with me is the Queen of Cause, the Queen of the West, the Queen of wherever she lives in Washington State, Megan Strand. Hi, Joe. I love being called the Queen. Thank you. You know what's exciting about today's show, Megan? All sorts of things. There's someone on the line that's actually going to help me get rid of those puffy marks under my eyes. Finally. (laughs) Finally. Finally. And we have, and we have a man that can address some of these issues. Although I know we're not here to focus on myself. We have Creighton Webb, who's Vice President of Corporate Communications and CSR for Mary Kay on the line. Hey, Creighton, how's it going? Hey, Joe, Megan, thank you both for having me. I appreciate it very much. And actually, Joe, I am 72 years old. Uh, I just used the men's product here at Mary Kay. It's no, amazing. no, 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 no. That's no, Creighton, amazing. I went to your LinkedIn page. You are not 72 years old. I, <laughs> I, saw, stuff. Your, I saw your LinkedIn picture. And I was like, man, this guy looks good. He's obviously uh, using the products. I could probably get a whole list of product recommendations. From- I need all the help I can get. Maybe you're like me. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to be with you guys today. No, Thanks thank for you, having thank me. You. Now, we actually are not here to talk about facial products for men, unfortunately, but we can talk offline about that. But we are here to talk about, I mean, this is like an incredible campaign, Creighton, this Don't Look Away campaign that you folks have been doing for so many years, which looks to educate uh, the public on recognizing the signs of an abusive relationship. I mean, a really tough issue for a brand yeah. to take on. You know, how did you start this whole program? How did you get involved in something? Yeah, well, I think the statistics are just alarming when you hear them. The fact that one in four women will be a victim of domestic violence at the hand of somebody who says that he loves her at some point in her lifetime. And if that doesn't bother you, and if you have kids, one in three young women will be a victim of emotional, sexual, verbal, or physical violence in a dating relationship. But, you know, the statistics aren't enough. Those, those are alarming and those are concerning. Believe it or not, this is our 22nd year that Mary Kay has been involved in the effort to prevent and end domestic violence. And truth be known, it really started with our founder, Mary Kay Ash. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're a company. Our mission is to enrich women's lives. At any given time, we've got about 600,000 women who are selling Mary Kay products, about 3.5 million around the world. With statistics like one in four, you better believe that a lot of women have been impacted by violence in their relationships. And that's alarming. And that was alarming to Mary Kay Ash. So that's what started all of this. Truth be known, we started the Don't Look Away campaign about three years ago when we really started focusing on prevention and and helping, because I don't know about you, but for me, for so many years, I would go out and I'd talk about this issue, I'd talk about the statistics, but the truth is, is I really didn't get it. It really wasn't my issue. It didn't, I mean, I, I didn't grow up in a home with abuse. I hadn't been in an abusive relationship. It was just so easy for me to look away, right, and just say, this isn't my problem. So what we decided is we have to figure out how everyone sees themselves in this issue. So if one in four women are impacted, who's the one in your life? And what role do you have in that? And that's where we came up with the don't look away. You've got an obligation to stand up and speak up. And you have some really fantastic videos that's working to share that story and that message. Can you talk a little bit about the video series and what what you've hoped to accomplish with that and what you have accomplished? You bet. There's There's two. Last year, we did a one in four series where we had four different women who all with varying backgrounds, one of whom is one of our cause champions, a woman by the name of Abby Farron, who is a fashion designer, but is also a dating abuse survivor. Um, And they all tell their story, whether it was in a married relationship, a dating relationship, whether it was financial abuse, emotional abuse, in some cases, sexual abuse, and then physical violence. And at the end of the video, all of them look in the camera and say, I am one in four. And then, of course, the graphic comes up that says, who's the one in your life? Don't look away. And then the thing that we tout to all of our audiences, the action is if you or someone you know 
has been in an abusive relationship, text the words love is to 22522. And that's part of our partnership with the National Domestic Violence Hotline. I mean, let's face it, 16 year olds aren't going to pick up a phone and call a 1 800 number and say right. this normal, but they might text. And then we've taken that now to a new video series, One in Three, which really focuses on dating violence and teens and young people and some of the obstacles they face in their dating relationships these days that are very complicated. And that's so scary, too, because you think like, man, one in four, that's a lot of people. And then when I looked at your page and I saw this promotion for one in three, uh, you know, that's something that blew my mind. And I thought I think, you know, I have a 16 year old daughter, too. So it makes me think, too, like one in three has the potential of being uh, abused in some way. That's right. And and I mean, imagine if one in three of our kids weren't going to graduate from high school Mm -hmm. or one in three were going to die in a car accident when they started to drive or one in three were going to experience cancer. I mean, we would go nuts. We would be very, very concerned. And I think violence against women and domestic violence still has a a stigma in this country. We don't want to talk about it. There's a lot of shame around it. That's right. That's right. And it's difficult, as I say, to see ourselves in this issue. How is this my problem? And we have to own it. How do you you're just talking about that, you know, this is this is a tough issue for a company to take on, you know, you're not dealing with adopting out cute fuzzy puppies, you're dealing with domestic violence, that's heavy. Hmm. So how do you talk about that internally in a way that sort of embraces the cause, but also kind of brings the authenticity piece to the forefront, because that's so important in an issue like this. It is. And to be honest with you, if we were starting today, I'm not sure that we would have adopted domestic violence Hmm. as our core philanthropic issue. The fact is, is I think, I think when companies adopt philanthropic issues, it works much better if it's not based on focus group or data. There has to be some kind of Although data is important, but there has to be some kind of organic heart to it. It has to connect with who you are as a company. For us, you know, 22 years ago, it was Mary Kay Ash who went to the Mary Kay Foundation and went to our government relations team and said, listen, I know you all are working on a number of different projects, but I want you to stop everything you're doing. And there's this new bill called the Violence Against Women Act that's being proposed. And I want you to go lobby Congress with these other nonprofit organizations that will supply money to district attorney's offices, to prosecutors, as well as police departments around the country to go after the perpetrators of domestic violence. This is just not okay. And we've got to put our mouth where our money is. It's not enough to just write a check. We've got to put our corporate reputation on the line in order to make change. Mm -hmm. So for us, Megan, I think it's because we've that uh, organic beginning, but, but I will tell you um, not in recent history, but over my uh, almost 11 year tenure here at Mary Kay, I've had lots of folks come to me and say, can't we just pick something happier, something nicer, Mm -hmm. something that's easier to talk about. Um, And that's, that's been an obstacle. And I think where we've landed is once we were able to move into the prevention side, and, and launch this Don't Look Away campaign, mm-hmm. uh, we haven't had that issue at yeah. all. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. We've got great buy-in across the board throughout the That's company. Good. Well, you know, it's interesting, too, because I think so much of the success these days that companies are having is really leading with authentic, pe- um, you know, authentic partnerships that they can lead with. And, you know, that's, and that, right. that's why I think something like this is actually perfect. And I do agree with you. I think there's all, you know, there's a lot of things out there too, where people just want to, they want to deal with, you know, happy issues or just something that has like a happy ending or something, you know, and, and I can understand that there's a place for that and stuff like that. But, you know, I love when, you know, you have, uh, these businesses that tackle these tough issues and, and, uh, Megan, it makes me think of, you know, Dave's killer bread, uh, because yeah. they tack, you know, they tackle, um, Creighton, they tackle about how to, how to get um, ex-cons back in the work phase, workforce, right. you know, because their whole argument is like, look, they don't have jobs. They're going to end back up in prison again. And, you know, right. uh, Jockey does a lot of things around adoption. Uh, Marshalls, which is a TJ, TJX brand, actually does a lot of things around the same thing you do, domestic abuse and stuff like that. And, you know, I yeah. think you have, I think brands, you know, especially as cause comes to age, I think there's a lot of respect out there from people about, you know, organizations that are taking on the tough issues. 
Well, I think it comes back to reputation, doesn't mm-hmm. it? I'm, and, you know, so many times I get asked, well, how do you measure success? Mm-hmm. And are you really measuring success when fewer women are impacted? Well, yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Sure. I mean, we, and frankly, because our corporate mission is to enrich women's lives, our products mainly are focused on women, and the women, uh, the people who sell our products, are the vast majority are women. Clearly, this is our audience. Mm-hmm. Uh, but by the same token, I think that consumers are smart, or, or as you would say, Joe, they're smart, right? Smart. I mean, they know. <laughs> no, I would say they're wicked smart. <laughs> so they know if what you're doing is just to sell more lipstick. I agree. Yeah. Uh, or yep. uh, or underwear, if you're in yeah. the case of jockey, yeah. or or if what you're doing is the real deal, if it's That's really right. part of your corporate DNA. Yeah. They can really sniff out insincerity these days. That's right. Yeah. That's but at right. the same time, doesn't there have to be some sort of business benefit to be able to keep those initiatives afloat? I mean, if the company's not doing well, then nothing does well, including the social good efforts. Well, as our CEO told me when we started officially our CSR program in 2007, if we're not making any money, we can't give any money away. Exactly. Um, so, I mean, I think that's the beauty of capitalism and the free free enterprise system is Frankly, in order to solve some of society's most terrible problems, it, government and the nonprofit industry can't do it alone. It requires the for-profit sector to stand up and not only put their money where their mouth is, but their mouth where their money is, yep. their reputation as well as their dollars. Yep. So you're absolutely right. And we're the first to say, listen, we're a cosmetics company and we're in the business of women's entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. We're not experts on preventing and ending domestic violence or violence against women. There are lots of other organizations like Love is Respect and the National Domestic Violence Hotline, Break the Cycle, others who we partner with. And I think that's an important word. If it, you know, lots of organizations do seagull philanthropy. They write the check, they fly in, they leave their deposit, and they fly <laughs> off. I I'm love that. Really, we're not interested in that. This has got to be a partnership because our most successful initiatives are going to be the ones where our consumers, our employees, and our independent sales force want to get involved and have an action item, something that they can do. Um, to help solve the problem. How do you activate that sales force around your cause campaigns? Because I do know that you have specific products that it, proceeds are going to part of the campaign at different at different times. But how how do you involve associates and how how do they respond? Yeah, I think cause related marketing is a piece of the puzzle, but not the only piece. Um, when we have products that benefit either the Mary Kay Foundation or other causes that, that work to prevent and end domestic violence, uh, you can imagine they sell like gangbusters. They're very, very popular. So that's a great tool when it comes to um, the revenue side and having you know the finances in order to invest in the partnerships and the organizations that are doing the good work. But I also think it has to do with activating your people. One of my favorite programs is what I call Lobbying for Good. So, I mean, it started at the mid-80s with, with Mary where we would activate members of our independent sales force to go lobby at their state legislature uh, on issues that have nothing to do with cosmetics or business. Um, But in the mid-80s, it was lobbying to require insurance companies to pay for mammograms. And then in the mid-90s, it was the Violence Against Women Act. And next week, we'll be up in Albany, New York, um, with the, the New York Coalition Against Domestic Violence and that organization on several bills they have, most of which are appropriations. And, you know, it's one thing if a corporate suit walks in from Dallas and says, Madam Senator, you know, Representative, would you please support this legislation? This is part of our core philanthropic cause at Mary Kay. Mm-hmm. It's a far different thing when a member of our independent sales force, a Mary Kay beauty consultant, walks in parked her pink Cadillac out in front of the Capitol building, (laughs) walks down that hall and says, Senator, great to see you. It was uh, such a pleasure to work on your campaign. Um, So glad that you won re-election. You know, I've been a constituent in your district for a long time. You may or may not be aware that there's this bill that's up for a vote in your committee next week. It's an appropriations bill. It's going to help keep domestic violence shelters open in our state. I expect you to vote for it. Mm -hmm. And here, you know, I mean, that goes a long way. It's very powerful. And they love to get behind it. 
Mm-hmm. And that's just one way. I think there's others as well. We, um, you know, I hesitate to talk about it because, but, because I think it is a confidential issue, but I think your audience is one that's focused. We used to donate empty lipstick tubes mm-hmm. to domestic violence shelters, and they would put their 1-800 number in there. Oh. Uh, now our sales force literally will buy these little round, compact mirrors. They buy them. They buy them. And when they see someone that they know – who it, it appears that they're in, a, in an unhealthy relationship, they give it to them. And inside hidden is a reminder of that text for help number that if you know, so, if you or someone you know is in an unhealthy relationship, text the words love is to 22522. Mm-hmm. And it is amazing. Wow. It is amazing how they take, how seriously our sales force takes that activation. That's awesome. You know what I love too is about, especially, and I saw that on your site about the lobbying because everyone's outside with their jackets on and it's all these different state capitals and stuff like that. And I, I was like, what's such a great program? Because it really is about the idea about what Mary Kay is all about and not about the products. And I think that's such great leadership uh, from a company in the sense like, you know what? We're about women. Uh, and we're about healthy women, and well, you know, and th- that's why we're out there doing these things. Well, Joe, I mean, uh, let me say, it's all about the products. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these, these ladies, these ladies sell a lot of lipstick. But when it comes yeah. to these programs, I think they're savvy enough to know that reputation comes from that organic, authentic discussion of who we are. I mean, this mm-hmm. is this is part of our DNA. And when mm-hmm. they become American Independent Beauty Consultant and they come to our corporate events and we spend a lot of time at our corporate events talking about how we give back and how we're trying to make the societal change, they're on board. Yeah. And a lot of it is because they are the one in four or yeah. they are the one in right. three or they know someone who is. Mm-hmm. So they're able to identify it and see themselves. And then they want to know, okay, well, how do we how do we get the next generation? Right, right. Well, that's a that's a good question, Creighton, because one of the things I'm kind of interested in too, the Mary Kay brand has been around for a long time. I mean, how do you how does this fit into your kind of millennial strategy, right? In the sense, like you've you've you know, there's so many brands out there. They want to stay current. They want to stay hip. They need to create you know attract that audience. You know, 36 and under. Is this one way of doing that? I think it is. Um, you know, we're pleased in the U.S. Um, about 52% of all of our new independent beauty consultants that be, that start a Mary Kay business are 35 or younger. Mm, wow. In, Bra- wow. in Brazil, um, uh, the average age is 28. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, as we as we talk about this issue, you know, moms who have kids, um, or even young women who start businesses that are in dating relationships themselves. Uh, when the downturn in the economy in 2009 and 2010, we saw a lot of young women, women, you know, leaving college and starting their own businesses. And, and, and the Mary Kay opportunity was a good way to do that that was low risk and low cost. But I think when you look at our partnerships with Alpha Chi Omega, you know, national sorority, their core philanthropic cause is also preventing and ending domestic violence. And we've been able to partner with them on campus uh, at several colleges and universities around the country in order to raise awareness. Girl Scouts, we've had a a pilot program here in North Texas uh, that has had a healthy relationship patch for Girl Scouts. Now, these are young women, 8 to 12 years old, right? They're, they're tweens at the oldest. So they're not in dating relationships. Mm-hmm. They've heard the term bullying, but at an early age, we've got to begin talking to the next generation about what's acceptable and what's not in dating relationships. We can't just rely on TV and we can't just rely on video games and we can't just rely on movies to tell us what true healthy relationships should look like. We've got to start talking or at an early age. And even, you know, from my personal perspective, I've got three little boys, eight and under, and a <laughs> and a brand new baby girl who's a month old. This is an important topic. And and it start it started in our household with just the simple you never hit a girl. Uh-huh. You don't hit girls. I mean, you shouldn't hit each other either. I mean, that, believe me, that's a mantra. <laughs> they got three boys. In our house. Like, yeah, exactly, exactly. But if we don't talk as men about this issue, we're we're, we're never going to find ourselves in this issue and see how it's our issue to help solve as well. Well, and you're you're talking about p- pivoting toward the prevention, and it sounds like you you found uh, so many different ways to do that. I'm also curious about how this domestic violence cause plays out for you globally. Are there any things that you have to kind of navigate in different countries because yeah, certain different things cultures. are taboo yeah, or yeah. yeah i mean different cultures treat this issue so differently absolutely when we 
started our official CSR program at Mary Kay. And again, long history of being philanthropic, but but really began getting strategic and global in 2007 and 2008. And our hope, my hope, was that all of our international subsidiaries around the world in the 35 plus markets where we where we sell Mary Kay would adopt violence against women as their issue. And there was a lot of pushback. Um, some countries just said, you know, we just can't talk about that here. Um, we're, we're, we're not, uh, our, our, from a societal norm perspective, others felt that it would cause regulatory issues if they did that. Um, and then one wow. market, one market even said, you know, we had a, we had a, a domestic violence hotline, um, but it's really not a problem in our country because nobody calls the hotline. Now I won't name the country, mm-hmm. but it is a closed society, traditionally paternalistic, you know, not exactly transparent. Right. kind of government situation. You know, mm-hmm. people don't didn't call the hotline not because domestic violence didn't exist, but because they were afraid of their name and number being shared and yeah. the confidentiality issue wasn't there. What we have seen in the almost last 10 years is um, eyes open and more and more of our international markets take this on as a core issue for them as well because it is internet it, this is not an issue that has a demographic of race or a demographic of socioeconomic limits it's it's not one that just hits poor minority people yeah. right mm-hmm. the one in three and one in four statistic hits everyone everywhere um, and we're we're seeing and making some progress it's fantastic well and speaking of which you had mentioned earlier, you sort of referenced measurement. So how, how are you measuring whether you're able to move the needle on it, such a complicated issue like domestic violence? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's funny. I, I am part of a men's auxiliary uh, here locally that, that talks about the role men have in, in this issue. Yeah. And uh, one of the men in our group um, was the lieutenant for the Dallas Police Department who headed up the family violence unit. And here in Dallas, our mayor uh, three years ago made this one of uh, stopping violence against women, one of his core issues. Mm -hmm. And so it was really interesting because this lieutenant with the police department was reporting back that the number of calls had increased substantially over the last three years. And Mm -hmm. of course, your immediate reaction is to think, you know, oh, wow, the problem must be getting bigger, right? right? More pronounced. And his point was absolutely not. We've known all along that the problem has existed and that the statistics are terrible. Mm. We just now know that people are feeling empowered to pick up the phone and call. And that's key. Yeah, yeah, in a way, it's very similar with us. Since we got involved with the National Domestic Violence Hotline, Break the Cycle, and Love is Respect, and their Text for Help program, we're the the title sponsor, the lead sponsor of the country's first text for help program. The number of texts they've received has gone up by 50%. Oh, my gosh. So that's a lot of people. That's thousands and thousands of people, over 200,000 a year of mm-hmm. young people who are reaching out through that text for help number. And, wow. and, that, and that, those texts, if I could, I don't, and I know where you're limited on time, Megan, but if I could, it's as simple as, hey, um, my, my boyfriend is constantly looking who I'm calling or texting. Is that normal? Or he's looking through my purse. Or he's pressuring me to do things when we're alone that I'm not ready to do. Or he just pushed me. What do I do? Right. Right. Um, these are real issues that they're dealing with. On the other hand, I had a young man say to me once, what do you mean I can't look at her phone or text? She cheated on me. Hmm. So oh. as we define what healthy relationships look like, whether it's through the text for help program or just talking, we ha- this isn't black and white. It's not simple. And, and our, our young people in today's society are dealing with very complicated um, social media driven, often um, obstacles and relationships. And mm-hmm. we've got to be savvy enough to respond and answer their call, answer yeah. their questions. Right, right. And, well, we, you know, so much of that too, Megan, as you and I can, as, you know, parents with young kids too, is thinking about social media. There's a lot of aggressive things on social media, but there's a lot of passive aggressive things too that we need to interpret for our kids and watch out for. Right. Yeah. And that's why I love this whole prevention me- message. And it really does sort of touch everyone. Like if you see something, say something, because there is there are resources and it is incumbent upon you to not just look away. So fantastic, fantastic. Creighton, thank you so, so much for spending your time sharing this entire effort with us. So many different pieces. So we really uh, appreciate you coming on and, and talking to us about it today. If people want to find out more about Mary Kay and all of these fantastic programs, how might they do that online? 
Sure. So uh, web page, uh, marykay.com slash don't look away. Um, or, of course, on Facebook, Mary Kay News. Or if uh, I can answer any questions or you'd like to connect, I'm uh, on Twitter at, at Creighton Web. Excellent. We'll put all of those in our show notes. How about you, Joe? Where can people find you online? Well, minute to minute, they can find me talking to Megan and Creighton on Twitter at Joe Waters. I'll have uh, cucumber slices on my eyes, of course. <laughs> Reduce eye strain. I want and, to see that. And yeah, uh, so I'll make sure to take a picture when I do that. Uh, people can find me, obviously, at SelfishGiving.com. And, and there's a bunch of over 4,000 examples of, of cause marketing campaigns on Pinterest.com front slash Joe Waters. What about you, Megan? Where can people find you? I'm also on Twitter at Megan Strand, and I tweet for the Cause Marketing Forum at TweetCMF. You can find show notes for today's episode at CauseUpdate.com as well as SelfishGiving.com. And of course, please make sure to subscribe to the podcast in iTunes. I want to make sure you don't miss an episode. And on behalf of Creighton and Joe and myself, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Cause Talk Radio, and we'll talk to you next time. 